This podcast is sponsored by the Fargo-Moorhead West Fargo Chamber of Commerce, hosting the Midwest Agriculture Summit June 28th to kick off the 2022 Midwest Agriculture Week. The summit will address agriculture, trends, challenges, legislation, and innovative technology with national businesses, elected officials, and industry leaders. Get involved at fmwfchamber.com. Hello there, this is Thomas Avanella, business reporter for The Forum and host of the Inforum Business Beat podcast. On tap this week, we'll have a rundown of the latest business headlines and a visit from Inforum digital producer Chris Kersman to discuss his latest story about electric vehicles. Let's get right to it. Moorhead's d and Industries recently marked its 40th anniversary. Inforum reporter Helmut Schmidt visited with d and leaders who reminisced on the company's growth over the decades. DM specializes in manufacturing doors and door hardware and also supplies windows for commercial and residential projects. The company has grown steadily over the years, including purchasing facilities in Oregon and Wisconsin. DM also became 100% employee owned in 2006. The company posted over $50 million in revenue in the last fiscal year. Triple X, which reopened in the Northport Shopping Center in 2021, closed down recently. The business originally opened in South Fargo in 2019, but closed due to the COVID 19 pandemic. Owner Marcel Baumgartner moved to the north side last year in the hopes of rebooting the company. However, those hopes have come to an end. The New Life Center opened its second Fargo thrift store on Memorial Day at 5556 51st Avenue South. The thrift store primarily stocks clothing, but it also carries housewares, knickknacks, pictures, sporting goods, and shoes. At 16,000 square feet, it quadruples the size of the New Life Center's North Fargo thrift store. Tom O'Keefe, New Life Center's operations director, invited the public to consider donating items or volunteering their time at the thrift store. The Metro welcomed two new restaurants this past week. Boss's Pizza and Chicken became Downtown Fargo's newest pizza offering when it opened Tuesday, June 7th. As Helmut Schmidt wrote, With 36 specialty pies, roasted chicken, and hours aimed to please night owls, Boss's will take its shot at becoming the boss downtown. Over in West Fargo, Randy's Diner 2 opened to customers Wednesday, June 8th. The second Randy's Diner location has been a long time coming, owner Heidi Rogenkamp told the forum. While the menu will carry over from the University Drive location, Randy's Diner 2 sports a refreshed interior that maintains an old-school feel. The new diner fills a large hole for family-friendly dining in West Fargo, Rogan Camp said. On Thursday, the Chamber hosted their monthly Eggs and Issues panel to discuss all things e-commerce with local experts. While there's no denying that online shopping is here to stay, retailers from the area report that in-person shopping is making a comeback, too. Chamber President and CEO Shannon Full moderated the discussion on Thursday. Also in attendance were Alyssa Adams, Chief Operating Officer of West Acres Development, Ethan Flax, Senior Operations Manager for the Amazon Fulfillment Center in Fargo, and Danny Gilseth, a founder of Grateful Gratefuls in West Fargo. Also on Thursday, Bell Bank rolled out its new Financial Empowerment Center. Nicknamed the Big Blue Bus, the center is designed to offer on-the-move banking services to communities which are traditionally underserved by banking. The bus has a dozen desktop computers where customers and non-customers alike can hop aboard to check their credit reports, learn about financial planning, and more. Emmanuel Glover, director of CRA and Fair Responsible Banking for Bell Bank, called the Big Blue Bus a new way of giving back to the community. Stopping at the gas station is on just about everybody's minds these days as gas prices continue to soar. A small contingent of FN motorists, however, haven't been worried about gas prices one bit. Those are the Metro's electric vehicle owners. Inforum digital producer Chris Kersman met with several EV owners to discuss their thoughts on switching from gas to electric. Chris, thanks for chatting with us today. Hey, Thomas. Thanks for having me aboard. And if I had to guess, a lot of these EV owners are probably feeling pretty happy about their purchases recently, given the current state of gas prices. Did you kind of find that to be the case? Uh, absolutely. The thing that I I kind of came away with from uh, getting the story started, because we just put a call out to talk to electric vehicle owners is that one, you know, so many, anybody who owns an electric vehicle right now is very likely an early adopter. Um, So they're, you know, really excited about the technology and about owning an electric vehicle and about being an an early adopter. So, you know, it's a good caveat, um, I think, to to sort of move forward with. And then um, they're, yeah, yeah, they're, they're a really good source of uh, information about the benefits of an electric vehicle, obviously. They're also, I, I what I considered fairly measured in terms of, 
you know, whatever the drawbacks are, you know, they, they were, they, they had a lot of what I felt was very honest feedback about some of the shortcomings of an electric vehicle and, and what I thought would be, you know, really good advice um, for somebody who's thinking about one right now. And obviously, like you said, these early adopter types are very excited about the technology. What were some of the benefits that you uh, heard about from these EV owners? Well, the, you know, the, the one obviously I keyed in on was, was cost. And I heard some really good um, sort of ways to put that. One, one owner, his name is Rolf Brockvotny. And he, he sort of did, did the math and he drove his Tesla down to uh, South Dakota last year for sort of like a Sturgis rally, but it's for Tesla owners. I think it's called like the Sound of Silence, I think was the name of it. Really interesting tidbit there because, you know, they don't make any noise. <laughs> but he drove that down to, uh, down to the Black Hills and back last year. And given the gas prices last year, he figured out like if I was driving a, a gas powered automobile, how much would I have spent? What would my total costs have been? And he figured it, it was equal to driving a car that makes or that that gets fifty five miles to the gallon if it were burning gas. Co- so that's cost wise. Um, which, if you think about, you know, that's uh, we drive a Subaru Outback, and that's twice what our Outback gets. Um, but there were other benefits too that I hadn't really thought of before going into this. Um, you know. Uh, electric vehicles have way fewer uh, moving parts, and um, so those things don't need to be. Um, those things aren't, you know, part of the maintenance schedule or the things that you have to pay for. The you know talking about uh, obviously the environmental impact was very big with several of these, not all of them, um, but several of them. You know, like the fact that they're not causing any sort of emissions. You know, they they all they all realize that you know something probably had to burn and put carbon into the atmosphere in order to power their vehicle, but they at least it wasn't gas and it wasn't you know pumping emissions into the atmosphere. So that was part of it. And you had mentioned earlier too that there's a lot of there's a lot to like about owning an EV. There's a lot to get excited about, and the technology will obviously continue to advance. What are some of the drawbacks at the moment, though, particularly as it pertains to people who are driving around in North Dakota and Minnesota? Yeah, there's still some really big drawbacks, and a lot of these owners were very upfront with me about them. If you have room in your, I guess, sort of your uh, stable of automobiles to add an electric vehicle, and then that's something that you would use to commute to and from work, say, um, to take on really short hops, that kind of thing. Then, then it might work for you. But if you don't, and one of the guys I talked to, um, this was the case for him. He had to take a lot of trips um, th- throughout the state. And so he, you know, he had to go down to Rochester a few times, the Twin Cities a few times, North, North Minnesota, Northern Minnesota, I think. And so, it, you know, those, those trips lasted longer because he would have to stop and charge that was that's a big downfall too is that while it's expanding access to to the charging infrastructure um still isn't quite there um for a lot of users and you know and it kind of depends on what kind of vehicle you're driving as well aside from that there's uh the upfront costs of an electronic electric vehicle some of them you know you can buy a used one that has like a you know a lower quality battery um, and they're, you know, the same, you know, not much different pricing than um, and a gas burning vehicle, um, but they'll still run you a few thousand dollars. Um, if you live in an apartment, um, I didn't think of this, but, you know, I own a home. And so, like, uh, hooking up a charging station to our garage wouldn't be too difficult. I couldn't do it myself. I'd have to hire it out, which would also cost money. But there's a lot of apartment dwellers in Fargo, right? And so if you wanted to own an electric car in Fargo and there wasn't a good place for you to like park your car overnight and charge it, it'd be kind of difficult, um, you know, if, if even impossible. Yeah, so those, those are the big ones. And then obviously there are, other, uh, there are other things to consider too. Like even though you're not buying gas, you will still have to pay for electricity. And you may still have to own a gas powered car to take road trips, you know, if you want to go to, you know, the Black Hills, say, or, <laughs> or something like that on a regular basis, it might be more convenient for you and probably maybe cheaper for you in the long run um, to maintain a gas car. And tell me about the ride you got to take in Todd's Tesla. What's the experience like on the inside of one of these EVs? 
I was uh, first sort of taken aback by how simple it was. There wasn't, there's not a lot of uh, chrome to it, you know, not a lot of like fancy doodads and what's it's. Uh, it's a very clean dashboard um, and it's just dominated by this giant video screen. It looks like an iPad Pro. It's about the same size, right? And so then um, he sort of drove us around and then we got to watch sort of how the, the self-driving uh, or assisted driving uh, part of a Tesla works, um, which is cool. Um, I, I, I'm not super interested in that, but uh, Todd was really interested in that. Uh, he's a software engineer and he's really interested in artificial intelligence. And so he's super interested in how the Tesla knows a person from a vehicle, knows when the what the speed limit is, knows when there's a red light, knows when there's a green light, um, knows when there's a traffic cone, that kind of stuff. And I can see that. Um, not, not why I buy a car um, personally, but I can see the interest. And then um, he uh, he took us out on the interstate and and sort of I won't say kicked it down because we didn't like break any laws or or speed or anything, um, but they, it accelerates so fast because it doesn't have to step up through gears. Um, it's just a single motor that just goes faster and goes slower. Um, so a lot, again, that whole thing with fewer moving parts it doesn't have a you know, a transmission necessarily. And so it doesn't have to gear up to go fast. So it accelerates really fast. And he like did this thing where he's like, puts us down. And like, you can feel yourself back against the back of the car. That was kind of cool. But other than that, I think the most remarkable thing about it is maybe how unremarkable it is. You know, it's, it's a, it's a car. And, um, you know, he takes it, he took it on a road trip to California. And it bears mentioning that the you know, the charging infrastructure for a Tesla is far different than uh, a lot of other electronic vehicle charging uh, options. And so he's taken it all around and he drives with it every day to work and, and all this stuff. And, you know, that's, that's kind of exactly what you'd want a car to be. So obviously we've got a lot of EV disciples here in the metro area, but what is the final verdict here? What is some of the advice that they gave to people who are considering an EV or maybe entertaining the thought a little bit more and just watching the gas prices go up and up? They all came down on um, sort of the side that people should consider them. And, you know, right now it's it's also kind of a hard time just because of uh, supply chain issues affect everything right now. And also demand is super high for electric vehicles. Um, so they're they're hard to come by in some cases. Um, but I heard a couple of different things. And one of the is like, you know, do your homework, do your research, um, ask, talk to other owners, watch YouTube videos, watch reviews that, you know, look at reviews like car and driver has a has a, you know, a, a consumer guide for buying an electric car. Uh, Edmonds had another one, but there's, there's tons of information out there and, you know, dive in, do your research, see if it would work for you. And then also, I think the big thing is that use case. Like, do you have like a day-to-day commute and a way that you can like take some of that driving time off of your gas powered car and put it onto this electric vehicle, which, you know, will probably would do the exact same thing as a gas burning car, but wouldn't um, be quite as expensive to drive. And, uh, and one of the one of the gentlemen I talked to, um, he rides an, uh, an electric bike. And so he, he and his family bought a, a diesel pickup um, not too long ago to pull an RV. And that, while he said that's great, uh, it's $135 to fill the thing. And so to sort of offset the cost of that, you know, he sort of broke down some napkin math, a uh, couple thousand dollars for the bike. He said he's probably because he's not putting gas in this car, he's saving, uh, he figured, I want to say about $150 a month in gas costs. He said he figures it'll take two seasons to pay that bike off. And that's, you know, obviously he's, he's not going to ride, drive that during the winter, but he's, you know, he's going to use it during the summer when the, when the weather allows. He can commute to, to and from work. He can go to meetings. He can run to the store. He can do a lot of the things that you need a day-to-day vehicle for. And then it helps offset the costs of that, uh, of that other vehicle, the one that, you know, costs more to drive and is costing more to drive uh, every day. So really, there's just no simple answer here. It it depends. It, there's a lot of factors at play. Yeah, I suppose, you know, it's like everything, right? Um, yeah, I think the biggest, you know, the, the I think the biggest thing and, you know, what I would what I would tell a listener is that um, one, don't rule it out. 
you know, it's not necessarily, I don't think it's so cut and dried that the technology isn't there anymore, um, that the cost isn't there anymore. It's, it's something that's, that's definitely worth considering, especially if you fit into that use case of having a commute, you know, if you have to drive a, it's a 10 minute drive, you know, just about from one place to anywhere else in Fargo in that, in that case, like, you know, do some math, like how much am I saving on gas? Um, how much more am I going to have to pay for electricity costs and that kind of thing and see if it's going to work. And if it works for you and or your family, um, you know, give it some serious thought. And that was Chris Kersman, digital producer for Inforum. Chris, thanks for joining us today. Hey, my pleasure, Thomas. And be sure to check out Chris's full story on electric vehicles on Inforum.com. That just about wraps things up for this week's episode of the Inforum Business Week podcast. I'm your host, Thomas Evanella. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And as always, visit Inforum.com slash business for the latest Metro business news. Inforum is proud to be a part of The Trust Project. To learn more about our ideals and commitment to trustworthy journalism, go to inform.com forward slash policies and standards.